Hi, everyone. I'm Alex Savage from KTVU, Fox 2 News here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And we want to talk about some of the latest headlines surrounding the coronavirus outbreak. And to do that, we bring in Dr. Vanila Singh, a clinical professor at Stanford School of Medicine and former chief medical officer with the Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Singh, good to have you, as always. Great to be here. Thank you. Let's uh, talk big picture about uh, what we're seeing in terms of the, the pandemic here in the U.S. A and the U.S. did just surpass uh, 6 million cases of COVID-19 uh, just three weeks after we reached the, the 5 million uh, mark. Uh, what, what in your mind is the significance of, of reaching uh, this, this number of cases? Well, look, I mean, it's a huge milestone. Uh, we are you know, passing uh, so many folks who have tested positive. And some of that is expected. We finally have a ramped up testing program that's still, it's not perfect, but it's far better than it was a couple of months ago. So we'd expect that we're gonna see more uh, case positivity rates across the nation in terms of uh, more testing being available. Having said that, it is uh, very humbling when you think about the uh, large effect devastating effect in many ways, both economically, socially, and of course, uh, for those who have succumbed to the disease. I mean, this has changed our uh, entire perspective as a nation and globally. So many countries are still uh, not seeing much travel, and it reflects uh, that this is a much a uh, bigger um, uh, threat, if you will, in terms of the coronavirus. Uh, I will say this, that there are some countries that have been uh, successful in keeping their rates down, but they are saying that they also are more vulnerable in terms of what conferred immunities there. We also know that people who uh, generally have had the infection and have recovered likely have some immunity. Right. How long it lasts, uh, we don't know yet. And we're, we're learning that as we go. But it does mean that it's a representation. There are many people out there who probably never got tested, were either with mild symptoms, and uh, probably that number is, is higher uh, than we realize. But it definitely speaks to this huge uh, change in our society and for many people uh, the devastating effects that it's had and i also hope that it's uh, a milestone where we're moving forward in terms of better understanding of this virus and having uh, treatment options and vaccines in the near future yeah certainly the treatments have, have, have come come a long way over the past uh, several months so you know as as the country hits this this milestone of 6 million cases at the same time we are seeing a slowdown uh, across the country in the number of new cases being reported on a daily basis obviously you know the cases are still elevated from what we saw a few months ago but but does that give you um, you feel encouraged by that at all that we are trending in the right direction yeah, absolutely. I mean, the good news in all of this, as we hit the 6 million number, is that our hospitalization rates are coming down significantly. That's a real important indicator that I look at because it goes to show who are the folks who are actually getting it, but worse yet having moderate to severe symptoms requiring care, the ICU rates and the fatality rates, all very important, really good numbers to see them trending downward. I think that's really where we need to focus uh, because at the end of the day, why are we so concerned about the virus? It's really because of the outcomes that it can cause in so many different populations. All right, so here in California, uh, it's it's a, a pretty big day uh, across, across the state because uh, last week uh, the governor and state officials announced this new uh, four-tier color-coded system for for figuring out when counties could reopen uh, businesses um, and, and schools for that matter hopefully at, at some point but um, this new system went into effect today and, and at the same time a lot of um, a lot of businesses like uh, hair salons nail salons and a lot of indoor shopping businesses got to reopen their doors as well as part of the this, this sort of overhaul of of the system by state officials. Uh, how significant is this in your mind? Well, it's uh, it's really great. I mean, first of all, for the viewers, it's like four different color codes to really help folks understand where are we in terms of viral transmission and the case positivity rate. So it simplifies the entire category of understanding who is at 
um, risk, you know, in terms of the counties and widespread viral transmission. So it goes from purple, where it's about seven cases per 100,000. Uh, then it goes to uh, red, orange, and then yellow, yellow being only one or less case per 100,000. And that's the goal, of course, to be there uh, and everything in between. And I think what it really does for our uh, folks here is it allows uh, for uh, the business community to really understand what in fact uh, they can strive for, to have a reliability and understanding of where they're gonna go. And uh, ultimately, uh, they basically have skin in the game. They know that they're reopening, they have motivation to keep the cleaning disinfectant standards high, provide public confidence and reassurance, and of course, uh, know if in fact their uh, county and they themselves are in danger of potentially closing down again. So I think it makes it really clear businesses need to know that for their economic uh, activity and uh, they they definitely can follow it. The, the challenges that we saw in the summer was with all the different factors being considered, including right. hospitalizations and IC rates and death rates, it was very confusing for the business community, uh, which really is people's economic livelihoods. It was confusing for society in general as to, you know, touch and go, you know, can we reliably go out and do things and, and have our business done or do we need to actually clamp back down and how do we make plans for the future? Yeah, and, and to, to, to let folks know, the, the new reopening system uh, here in California only is only based on two metrics, as opposed to all those metrics you were talking about before. This is only based on uh, the number of new cases per 100,000 residents per day, and also the test positivity rate in a particular county. But the other aspect of this, it, right, there is more clarity. It's a little bit easier to follow. It's simpler um, in many ways. But at the same time, it's also going to be a more gradual process, it seems, because a county has to remain in a certain tier for three weeks before they can even think about advancing uh, to, to another tier and, and reopening more, more businesses. Uh, it, it, you know, do you think that that kind of gradual approach is going to be more effective in terms of keeping the cases down? Well, you know, the, the, this is a big challenge because if you look at the Bay Area, most all the counties are in the purple, the highest, most widespread category. And for them to get down to uh, the yellow category, I mean, we can already see it's going to take them uh, months, really, quite honestly. And I think that's that's also tough because I think people really want to just move forward in this. And so, the, you know, one of the criticisms can be that you have to remain in this um, lower category, each one going step by step before you feel like you're actually rewarded for the improvement. Um, but, you know, hopefully what we see is that as, uh, you know, as we move forward and we adjust, we understand it, our businesses are careful, we adjust to the schools as they are, that there's a motivation of the counties in general, the, the communities in general, to really help uh, uh, bring those numbers down now. Some of this isn't gonna be fair. Some of the counties are large and they are less dense and they're, you know, they just have it better uh, and are likely gonna move forward faster. Whereas others, there's a lot of density, uh, which is interesting because if you look at San Francisco, it's actually uh, one of the two that is in the red, Napa and San Francisco, which is very, very interesting right. to me. Uh, but we'll see how, how this plays out. And uh, certainly um, my hope is that they're going to be open to modification if we find that it is, it is limiting in terms of uh, people regaining their livelihoods. Yeah. Yep. So the new system in place uh, here in California. So, yeah, as you say, it's going to be it's going to be a gradual process. But but things, you know, everyone sort of knows where they stand a little bit better. Uh, it would seem. Uh, let me ask you about one of the other issues that's out there right now having to do with the uh, creation of a vaccine, a safe and effective vaccine. And uh, the commissioner uh, of the FDA uh, in an interview with the Financial Times, he indicated that he would be willing to grant emergency authorization to a vaccine even before phase three trials had been completed. Uh, I, I wanna get your, your, your thoughts on that. Do you think that's an appropriate thing to, to happen? Well, I think what's really important to note is that the FDA has very rigorous processes and, and that we should stay focused on in that how they grant vaccine uh, ultimate uh, approval is gonna go through the phases where in some of the cases of the vaccines that are being looked at, they are actually in their phase three trials as we speak. The real question is, as they get rolling data, 
and they have compelling evidence of uh, important uh, conferred immune uh, defense for certain vulnerable groups, I think being open to considering uh, emergency use authorization in the vulnerable that have the higher risk, you know, it's about weighing the risk and benefits in those folks, perhaps they would consider um, providing uh, emergency use authorization, again, for people who are vulnerable, who are at risk because of their medical conditions or immune systems, or those who are exposed in the, in the front line, uh, such as with the healthcare workers. Right. So that's, and that's, that's what you think the idea would be here with the emergency authorization. It would be distributing, it would be targeted distribution to, to folks who are most at high risk. This wouldn't be the widespread distribution of the vaccine. You would want, you would need full approval before you start giving the vaccine to tens of millions of people across the country. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that what is going to be very important is that those folks who are likely to, even if they had COVID, would likely recover, have mild to moderate symptoms, having emergency use authorization would only help uh, potentially um, decrease the chances of them either having a bad illness or really more importantly, transmitting it. So their risk in general of COVID is lower compared to those folks who have vulnerabilities. They have medical issues that definitely put them at risk for a bad clinical outcome. And, and we know that that could mean ICU admission and ultimately succumbing to the disease. Uh, so if in fact, the FDA commissioner, as they indicated an openness to considering this, there, uh, in, in my understanding, would likely only consider it if there's compelling evidence mm -hmm. uh, in, in some subsets of the population as the data comes out. I don't think this will mean that uh, we are gonna bypass safety and effectiveness evaluation in the larger phase three clinical trial, which is really what is going on. Phase one and phase two really have looked at safety and efficacy, but uh, in, in tiered stages, in smaller groups, now it's the broader population, healthy people. They're looking at what is the immune response. If the data is compelling enough, uh, I believe if it, if it really shows that it is able to get the uh, milestones that have been already designated and, and uh, may potentially show a better risk-benefit um, uh, ratio, if you will, for the vulnerable, then I think that there might be some consideration and talk about providing the emergency use authorization. Okay, you know, and you talk about sort of that perception that, that some folks have about you know, oh well, are we are we cutting corners here to 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 get ourselves to to a vaccine being distributed? You know, before it might actually be, uh, you know, deemed safe and effective. And with that being said, if you have that perception, um, do, do you do you worry at all about you know once once you do have this vaccine being widely distributed, do you do you worry about uh, a fair number of people being reluctant to take the vaccine? There's a lot of you know there's a lot of talk about this that even once we have a vaccine. There, there may be some folks who are who are hesitant. Is that how much of a concern is that for you? Well, I think it's always a big concern. I think that's also why we have to be very careful uh, to emphasize that we have rigorous clinical uh, trials and processes in the United States. Something that uh, I think the country has always had as a tradition in our medical and scientific community. So I want to emphasize that. And also, when uh, we hear you know sensational talk on on TV about uh, you know, the president or the administration bypassing uh, important safety uh, channels, I think that that does a great disservice to uh, what is really an all-out public-private effort that is uh, ongoing here, uh, you know, at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in D.C. Uh, with many uh, private companies that have the scientific expertise and really unprecedented resources uh, and ingenuity being put into this to really find a very important part of the solution in this pandemic. So uh, I, would, I would state to people that, um, you know, it, as we've had rigorous trials always for prior vaccinations and medical therapeutics, that uh, this uh, uh, discussion is really not about uh, cutting um, uh, shortcuts for uh, the safety aspects but it's really about compelling data that if that were to happen, and again, we don't know if it is, this is all in the uh, theoretical, right. if that were to happen, uh, that's really what the um, uh, purpose, if you will, of the emergency use authorization is, is when there's compelling data, you know, you think about in terms of ethics, 
uh, and you, you know something may really help people who are at great risk for bad outcomes for succumbing to the disease, right. uh, then you have to weigh that and, and see if in fact it's worthwhile getting it out to those folks. Uh, including our healthcare workers, uh, there might be different subsets, and and I think that is what is interesting right now. One other thing I do want to add is that, mm -hmm. as ad folks are thinking about this, one of the very important things is for the clinical trials is really to get diverse populations. And I know that they're yeah. really trying to seek uh, uh, minority, Native American, African American, L Latino um, uh, populations to really take part in the clinical trials, and that's going to be really important for those communities to really be able to uh, understand what the larger effects are, both in effectiveness and safety. Absolutely. Yeah, so important to get that broad cross-section of the population. So you really, really understand how, how the vaccine, you know, uh, how different people uh, are affected by the vaccine. Um, all right. Well, we'll we'll, uh, we'll see what the FDA commissioner does. I mean, obviously, he, you know, he has not made any commitments one way or another, but said he's open to the idea of, of, of an emergency authorization for a vaccine. So we'll uh, we'll see how that that plays out. Uh, we always appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your thoughts, Dr. Vanila Singh, uh, clinical professor at Stanford School of Medicine and uh, former chief medical officer with the Department of Health and Human Services. Thanks so much, as always, for coming on. I'm Alex Savage from KTVU, Fox 2 News uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I will talk to you next time.